Welcome to the most realistic racing simulation ever developed for the PC. If you've never played a papyrus racing sim before, you may be in for a surprise the first time you get out on the track, because in real life, driving a 750 horsepower stock car at the limit isn't easy, and it's not easy to do in the game either. You can't expect to become a master at it overnight. First, you need a solid understanding of the basics, and that's where these driving lessons will help. Before we get down to business, we've got to talk about frame rate. Frame rate is a measure of how many times per second your screen gets redrawn in order to keep pace with the action. To find your frame rate, just press the F key while you're driving. Your frame rate will be shown in the upper right corner of the screen. Ideally, you'll want this value to stay above 30 at all times. When your frame rate dips below 20, the game will start to become choppy, and your controller movements will become delayed, making it much easier to lose control of the car. NASCAR Racing includes a variety of graphic and sound options that will reduce the load on your system and get your frame rate up where it belongs. Going from 32-bit to 16-bit color can give you a large boost in frame rate. Going to a lower resolution, reducing the mirror detail level, reducing the drawing distance, reducing the number of opponent cars displayed, and disabling graphic effects like smoke can also do wonders for your frame rate. Okay, now it's time for some driving tips. First one is very simple. Don't go too fast. This is a common mistake made by almost everyone. You've got to remember that in this game, you can't just hop in the car, mash the gas pedal to the floor, and have it steer like a slot car. Here, you're sitting on top of a 750 horsepower rear wheel drive beast that has been modeled to behave as realistically as possible. So remember, just like when you first started driving for real, take it easy out there and pay close attention to how the car reacts to your control inputs. You'll want to start out at a nice wide track with long turns that will force you to let up off the throttle. Try Michigan or California for starters. The second driving tip is not as obvious, but it's important to understand. At high speed, the throttle and brake are used to steer the car. In normal low speed driving, when the tires have plenty of available grip, the steering wheel controls the steering and the throttle and brake control speed. But what happens when the speed increases to where the tires reach the limit of their grip? At that point, the car's rotation is controlled more by how much weight is on the front and rear wheels, not the steering angle. Braking will cause weight to shift to the front of the car, making it want to turn more. Applying the throttle will cause weight to shift to the rear of the car, making it want to turn less. Here's an example. As the car goes through the corner, We'll keep the steering angle the same, but we'll let up on the throttle. Watch as the car pulls to the inside. This time, we keep the steering angle constant, but we'll add some throttle. This time, the car pushes to the outside. When the tires exceed their grip limit and lose traction, the opposite effects occur. Too much brake will cause the car to plow forward and refuse to turn. Too much throttle will cause the rear of the car to snap around and spin. If you want to master car control, and you have to master car control if you want to win races, you'll need to properly anticipate these effects and compensate for them by using the steering wheel. For these reasons, it's important for you to be smooth with the steering, throttle, and brake. Just as you wouldn't violently jerk the steering wheel back and forth, don't jump on and off the throttle and brake suddenly. Instead, do what the pros call rolling, into and out of the throttle and brake. Apply them gradually and come off them gradually and you'll have fewer unscheduled meetings with the wall. Being smooth will also help you preserve your tires. That means fewer pit stops and fewer pit stops will help you win races. Here's another tip that will not only help you out on the racetrack but out on the street as well. As you're driving around the track concentrate not on where you are but on where you will be in the next four to five seconds. When you see the next corner in the distance, visualize steering into it, taking the correct line through it, and coming out of it. You'll be able to set up for the corner earlier, and any corrections you may need to make will be less drastic because you'll be making them earlier rather than at the last second. You'll also have more time to avoid any trouble that may be developing up ahead. Look for the shaded racing groove on the track. That will show you the quickest line through each corner. Visualization is definitely important, but don't rely solely on your eyes out there. 
Your ears are just as important when it comes to getting the most out of your car. Listen to your car as you go through the corners. Are the tires squealing like crazy? If so, you're going too fast. On the other hand, if they're not squealing at all, you're probably going too slowly. You want to shoot for a little bit of squealing, but remember that too much of it can quickly translate to a set of blistered, useless tires. The last fundamental tip we'll cover here is a simple one. Stay out of the garage. You really shouldn't be tinkering with the car's setups until you're able to turn smooth, consistent laps with the default setups that come with the game. Why? Because until you've developed a proven driving technique, and until you've learned to anticipate how the car will react in any given situation, the best car setup in the world can be useless. The only way you can gain this knowledge is through practice. When you get to the point where you can honestly determine that the car's setup and not your driving technique is what's holding you back from better lap times, that's when you should feel free to go ahead and start tinkering in the garage. Until then, stay out of there. As we wrap up this first lesson, here's something you want to keep in mind. When you get out there and start practicing, you're going to make mistakes. Everybody does. Mistakes are part of the learning process, because if you don't make them, how will you find out where the limits really are? The important thing is to learn from those mistakes and try not to repeat them. So when you mess up, don't worry about it, because unlike real life, the only thing that'll get bruised here is your ego. other sports, auto racing has a language all its own, so it's really in your best interest to take some time to learn the lingo. This lesson will explain some of the most commonly heard racing terms and will serve as your Racing to English Dictionary. A push happens when the rear end of the car has more grip than the front. When the car enters a corner, it doesn't want to turn, and instead it tries to drift up the track. If too much speed is carried into the corner, the front wheels will break traction first, causing the car to plow. A pushing condition is also called understeer. In general, your car will tend to push more and more as your fuel burns off and as the tires wear. A car that pushes is easy to control, but it's slow. The default setups that come with the game have a tendency to push in order to make them easier to drive. Sometimes you'll find that your car is pushing when you're closely following another car through a corner. This kind of push has nothing to do with the car's setup. It's all due to aerodynamics, and that's why it's called an aero push. Basically, when you're right on someone's tail, most of the air that would normally be pushing down on the front of your car is being blocked by the car in front. Less air on the front of the car translates to less grip or downforce at the front of the car. A loose condition is the opposite of a push. When a car is loose, its front end has more grip than the rear. When the car enters a corner, it will tend to fishtail and the rear end will try to step out. If too much speed is carried into the corner, the rear wheels will break traction first, often resulting in a spin. A loose condition is also called oversteer. A loose car can be very fast, but it's on the ragged edge of control. In the hands of an experienced driver, a loose car is capable of turning the fastest laps on the racetrack. If you've got a car right on your tail as you're going through a corner, you can suddenly develop a loose condition which has nothing to do with the car's setup. Basically, it's the opposite effect of the aero push, and it's called, surprise, surprise, aero loose. This time, a portion of the air that would normally be pushing down on the back of your car is being blocked by the car in back. Less air on the back of the car translates to less rear downforce, and that will loosen up the car. There's one other way to trigger a loose condition, it's called trailing throttle oversteer, and it happens when you quickly lift off the throttle while cornering. The car's weight suddenly shifts forward, the rear end gets light, and the car can easily go into a spin. The best way to avoid trailing throttle oversteer is to be smooth with that throttle and roll out of it rather than abruptly lift. A balanced or neutral car is exactly what it sounds like, neither pushing nor loose. It's right in the middle, and the result is a fast, well-balanced car that handles predictably. When you're driving through a corner near the limit, at some point, the car will stop drifting to the outside, and the inside tires will regain traction. At that point, the car is considered to have taken a set in the corner and is more responsive to your control inputs. That's usually the point at which you want to get back into the throttle and prepare to exit the corner. 
This is actually much easier to feel than it is to describe. When the car sets, you'll know it. This one is straight from your high school driver's education course, and it simply involves steering in the direction of a skid or drift in order to prevent the spin. In NASCAR, you need to be prepared to counter-steer at all times, but particularly when you're getting on the throttle and exiting a corner, because that's when the car loves to snap around. The earlier you can anticipate the need to counter-steer, the smaller the correction you'll need to make, and the less time you'll lose. The racing groove, or the groove for short, is generally the fastest path around the track. On oval tracks, the groove usually runs right up near the wall on the straights and low in the turns. The groove is plainly visible in the turns. Just look for the darkened asphalt. If you're having trouble finding the groove, press the R key while you're driving, and it will be highlighted for you. The apex is the point on the inside of a turn where the car transitions from entering to exiting the turn. The apex is usually at the halfway point of the turn. On most ovals, the two turns at one end of the racetrack will have a single apex. Often, drivers will try to just clip the apex in order to make the turn as straight as possible and maintain a high speed. The apron is located at the bottom of the racetrack. It's a paved surface that separates the racing surface from the infield. It's almost always flat. Be very careful when you transition from the racing surface to the apron especially at tracks with a lot of banking. The blend line is a painted white or yellow line near the apron which starts at the pit exit. When leaving the pits, you need to stay below the line before you can merge safely with race traffic. When you hear your spotter say, okay, merge when you can, you're clear to move back onto the racing surface at any time. The spotter is your second set of eyes out there. He sits high up in the grandstands so he can see the entire racetrack. If there's a car alongside you, or if there's a wreck, he'll let you know about it. Your spotter can be a huge help to you, but remember, things happen quickly out there. A passing lane can open up or close down a fraction of a second before your spotter lets you know about it. If you use your spotter as an aid and not as a replacement for the mirror, you'll be in good shape. The crew chief is the leader of your team, and he's in charge of your pit crew. All of your pit service requests will go through him, and he will give you scoring updates and lap times. In NASCAR, flags are displayed by the starter and by the pit official. The starter is the official located in the elevated box at the start-finish line. The pit official is located at the beginning of pit road. Sometimes, if you're near the back of the pack, the starter can be tough to see. That's why there's a small flag indicator located in your speed gear display on the left side of the screen. When the starter swaps flags, the flag indicator will update. If you don't see the speed display and flag indicator, press the S key. Let's go through the flags and explain what each of them means. When the green flag is displayed by the starter, it signifies either the start of the race or the restart of the race after a caution period. All cars are expected to accelerate to the start-finish line and begin racing. When the green flag is displayed by the pit flagger, it means that pit road is open. The yellow, or caution flag, is displayed by the starter, and it signifies a dangerous condition on the track. When the yellow flag comes out, your spotter will tell you, and the flag indicator will turn yellow. Your spotter should also tell you where the trouble is. All cars are expected to race back to the start-finish line, slow down, and get in line behind the pace car. Naturally, if you have to go past an accident scene while you're racing back to the line, use some common sense and make sure you get past it in one piece. Once you get back to the line, you'll hear your spotter say, OK, we're under caution. That's your cue to start slowing down, because once you're under caution, you're not allowed to pass another car unless that car is going very slowly or is off the racing surface. Don't worry. If you pass someone by mistake, your spotter will let you know. Just let that car pass you back, and you won't get penalized. Once you're under caution, you'll need to take your spot in the pacing line. That's the line of cars that forms up behind the pace car. Your spotter will tell you the number of the car you'll need to stay behind. Usually that car will be clearly visible, but if it isn't, call up the F2 standings display to see how far ahead of you it is. Accelerate just enough to catch up to the end of the pacing line and make sure you stay behind the car your spotter told you to stay behind. The yellow flag caution period can last anywhere from two to several laps, depending on the length of the track and the severity of the problem. In NASCAR, laps run under caution count toward the race total, and it's possible for a race to end under caution as well.
keep that in mind if you see the yellow flag come out just a couple of laps from the end of the race. The black flag is displayed by the starter, and it means that you have broken a rule and you need to report to your pit stall to serve a penalty. Unlike the other flags in the game, the black flag is driver specific, so if you see it, it's meant for you. When the black flag comes out, your flag indicator will turn black, and your crew chief will tell you the reason you've been penalized. To serve a black flag penalty, you'll need to report to your pit stall under green flag conditions. At that point, a NASCAR official will count off the penalty time. Once it has expired, the black flag will be cleared, and you may continue racing. You'll have a total of four green flag laps to come in and serve your penalty. If you fail to do so, you'll be disqualified. If you get a black flag with fewer than four green flag laps remaining in the race, and the race ends before you report to the pits, you'll be given a post-race penalty instead. If you rack up multiple penalties, you can clear all of them during a single visit to the pits, but you may be there for a while, because for each penalty beyond the first one, you'll be socked with an additional 20-second premium. One last point about serving penalties. We've already mentioned that you have to serve them under green flag conditions, but there is one very rare exception to that rule. If you happen to be on pit road and en route to your pit stall when the yellow flag comes out, you'll still be able to serve your penalty, even though you'll technically be under yellow flag conditions when you get to your stall. The red flag is shown only by the pit flagger, and it means that pit road is closed. Pit road is closed only under yellow flag conditions, and even then, it's only closed for a short period of time. The white flag is displayed by the starter, and it means that there's one lap remaining for the leader of the race. The white flag will come out a second or two before the race leader crosses the line to begin the final lap, so if you happen to be just ahead of the leader at this point, there's a chance that you'll see a white flag that isn't meant for you. Don't be fooled. When you come back around to the start-finish line, your crew chief will let you know that you've taken the white flag. The checkered flag is displayed by the starter, and it means the end of the race. Like the white flag, the checkered will come out a second or two before the race leader crosses the line. If you're just ahead of the leader, there's a chance you'll see the flag, even though it's not meant for you. Again, listen to your crew chief. Once you cross the start-finish line again, he'll tell you that you've taken the checkered flag and the race is over. NASCAR Racing 2003 season includes most of the rules and procedures found in the NASCAR rulebook, and there are quite a few of them. A lot of NASCAR fans aren't familiar with many of the rules, simply because a good portion of them are in effect only under yellow flag conditions, when the TV networks usually take a commercial break. Strapped into the cockpit, the rules are very important. They provide a safe and fair environment in which to race. This lesson will take you through the NASCAR rulebook step by step. Now that you're familiar with the flags, it's time to go over the rules and the penalties for failing to obey them. Not all of the rules are enforced at all times. Arcade mode has a relaxed set of rules, and even in simulation mode, most of the rules are disabled in the practice and happy hour sessions. If you break one of the rules during either of those sessions, your crew chief will still let you know about it, but at least you won't have to suffer the consequences the way you would during qualifying or during the race. You have to observe the pit road speed limit. This is probably the most common penalty in the game, and it's easily avoided. First, you need to know the pit road speed limit. When you exit your pit stall, your crew chief will tell you the RPM you need to stay under in order to avoid breaking the speed limit. Remember that value is based on second gear, not first. Second, when you're exiting the pits, wait for your spotter to say, OK, you're clear of pit road, before you start to accelerate. Third, and most importantly, you need to practice those pit stops and make sure you give yourself enough time to get down to the speed limit when you exit the racing surface and come down onto pit road. The penalty for speeding in the pits changed during the 2002 season. Now, if you're under green flag conditions and speed in the pits, you'll be black flagged and forced to make what's called a drive-through penalty. To clear the black flag, you'll have to come all the way around the track and drive down pit road again, obeying the speed limit, of course. You can't receive service during the drive-through, and if you break the speed limit during the drive-through, you'll have to serve a stop-and-go penalty. If you speed in the pits under yellow flag conditions, you won't be black flagged, but you'll have to go to the end of the longer pacing line. When exiting the pits, you must merge at the proper time. When you exit the pits, you can't immediately pull back into race traffic. Instead, you must stay down on the track's apron, or as far from the racing surface as possible, and below the blend line until you hear your spotter say, OK, merge when you can. Each track has a different merge point, but for the most part, you'll have to wait until the back straight before being allowed to merge. 
there is a little bit of leeway built into this rule. If you attempt to merge early, you'll hear your spotter say, don't merge yet. You'll be given a split second to bring the car back to a legal position. Failure to do so will trigger the penalty. If you break this rule under green flag conditions, you'll be black flagged and you'll have to serve a stop and go penalty. Under yellow flag conditions, you won't be black flagged, but your penalty will be to go to the end of the longer pacing line. When you enter the pits, you need to do it properly. Basically, the rule was designed to prevent cars from coming into the pits from the side in an attempt to spend as little time as possible on the speed limited area of pit road. If you're not sure of the proper procedure for entering the pits, just start a practice session and watch one of the computer controlled cars do it. Homestead is the only track in the game that requires the use of a special access road in order to pit legally. If you break this rule, you'll be black flagged and you'll have to come in and serve a stop and go penalty. You can't enter the pits when they're closed. This one's simple enough. You have to wait until the pits are open and you're eligible to pit before you can make a pit stop. This rule applies under yellow flag conditions only. When the yellow comes out, the pits close. If you're near the pits when it happens, you'll see the pit flagger display a red flag. The pits remain closed until the pace car comes around and passes the pit entrance. At that point, cars that are on the lead lap may come in and pit. All other cars must wait until the following lap, at which point the pits will be open for all cars. If you're already on pit road when the yellow flag comes out, you won't be penalized for entering a closed pit. If you break this rule, you won't be black flagged, but you'll be sent to the end of the longer pacing line. You can't pass the stop go man. This is another simple one, and it also applies only in races with yellow flags. The stop go man is a NASCAR official positioned at the end of pit road. He is responsible for making sure that cars exiting the pits do not interfere with the line of cars pacing around the track. The majority of the time, he'll be displaying a go signal, which means that you're free to exit the pits normally. However, when the pacing line gets close to the pit exit, the stop go man will display the stop signal. When this happens, cars exiting the pits cannot pass the stop go man. They must wait until the pacing line passes the pit exit and the stop go man switches to the go signal before being allowed to exit pit road. Breaking this rule will not result in a black flag, but you'll be sent to the end of the longer pacing line. You can't drive against the traffic. This is the ultimate no-no. If you drive against the traffic, either head-on or in reverse, you'll be disqualified from the race. There is a buffer built into this rule to account for those times when it may be necessary to briefly drive against traffic in order to get back onto the track after a nasty spin or similar off-road excursion. You can't pass under caution. After the yellow flag comes out and you have raced back to the start-finish line, you are considered to be under caution. Once you're under caution, you aren't allowed to pass, and that includes the pace car, too. There are two exceptions to this rule. Cars that aren't on the racing surface may be passed, and cars that are on the racing surface, but which are going too slowly, also may be passed. If you're not sure whether or not you should pass someone, it's better to pass and be told to fall back, rather than not pass and potentially cause a mess for all the cars behind you. Your spotter will make your life a lot easier here. Listen to him, and you won't go wrong. If you do pass someone under yellow, you'll have until the green flag flies to get back into the correct place in line. If you don't, you'll be black flagged. The penalty time will be just long enough to offset any advantage you gain. You can't pass the leader before the start-finish line on a start or restart. If you are at the front of the pacing line, in the line opposite the leader, you aren't allowed to pass the leader until he crosses the start-finish line. This rule is designed to give the leader an advantage on starts and restarts. If the leader is going too slowly or suddenly decides to break before the start-finish line, this rule is ignored. This is done to prevent the leader from intentionally trying to get the car in the other row to beat him to the line by breaking at the last moment. Breaking this rule triggers the black flag and you'll have to come in and serve a stop-and-go penalty. You can't pass a car in the same pacing line on the inside before the start-finish line. Huh? Actually, this one is pretty simple. On a start or restart, if you want to pass a car that's in your pacing line, you can't do it on the inside until you get to the start-finish line. Passing on the outside is okay, but you'll find that experienced drivers will guard against this tactic. This rule is in place in order to prevent people from hanging back at the start and trying to time the green flag so that they can just zoom by everybody before they get to the first corner. Again, this rule is ignored if the car in front is going too slowly. Your spotter will let you know. Breaking this rule will result in a black flag stop-and-go penalty. 
You can't drive around with a heavily damaged car. NASCAR does not allow cars that are heavily damaged to continue driving around the track, so if you're damaged to the point that you're dropping debris or fluids on the racetrack, you can expect to see the black flag. In this case, your pit crew will have to repair your car to an acceptable state before you'll be allowed back onto the track. Sometimes you may be damaged to the point that it won't be possible for the crew to repair your car. In this case, you'll have no alternative but to retire from the race. This type of black flag penalty is the only one which may be cleared under yellow or green flag conditions. After all, NASCAR doesn't want cars dropping debris all over the racetrack for an entire caution period. When you race with yellow flags turned on, you'll need to decide whether or not you'd like to use single file or double file restart rules. In a double file restart, any cars that are one or more laps down are allowed to form a second pacing line on the inside of the lead lap cars. Not surprisingly, a single file restart keeps all the cars in a single pacing line. Whether it's due to an accident, a bad pit stop, or a poorly timed caution flag, it's easy to lose a lap during a NASCAR race. Getting back onto the lead lap is much easier if you can take the restart from near the front of the field rather than from behind a long line of lead lap cars. That's precisely why NASCAR introduced double file restarts. It gives cars a better chance of getting back onto the lead lap. NASCAR uses double file restarts almost all of the time. There are only two exceptions. First, they aren't used if there are fewer than 10 laps remaining in the race. And second, they are never used at the road courses. So how does a double file restart work? Well, it works the same way a single file restart does, right up until the point when the one lap to green signal is given. That's when the lights on the pace car will go out and you'll hear your crew chief say, we're going green next time by. At that point, you can pull to the inside and line up on the inside of the lead lap cars. If you're in the wrong place, your spotter will let you know. Be sure to use that F2 box to know which cars are close by so that if your spotter tells you to pass or stay behind a particular car, you'll know where that car is. So those are the rules that you'll have to pay attention to when out on the track. As you can see, there's quite a bit to go over during the driver's meeting. But don't worry, if you can't remember all these rules, just listen to your spotter and he'll keep you out of trouble. We see it almost every weekend. Some driver's got a great car and he's been running near the front all day long. The laps are winding down and he comes into the pits for one last stop. Then something goes wrong. He overshoots his pit stall, or he parks too close to the pit wall, or he breaks the pit road speed limit. Suddenly his hopes for a win are gone. Not because he wasn't fast enough, but because of a bad pit stop. Good pit stops don't just happen. They require concentration, precision, and above all else, practice. Every second you spend in the pits translates to hundreds of feet out on the racetrack. A pit stop involves a lot more than the 15 seconds or so that it takes your crew to add fuel and change tires. This lesson will break the pitting process down into several steps, and it will give you tips for getting through each of those steps as quickly as possible. Before we go through those steps, there are a couple of things you need to know like where your pit stall is. Yeah, it doesn't get much more basic than that, but remember, chances are good that the stall you used in practice won't be the one you'll be using in the race. Why? Because for the happy hour and race sessions, pit stalls are assigned by qualifying order. The fastest qualifier gets the pit stall closest to the pit exit. The next fastest qualifier gets the stall immediately behind him, and so it goes all the way down to the end of the field. So if you have a happy hour session, pay attention to where your stall is because that's where it will be during the race, too. If you skipped happy hour, just remember where you qualified. That will give you a good idea of how far down pit road your stall is. Making a good pit stop involves more than just executing the fundamental techniques that you'll find in this lesson. It also takes a good feel for the specific challenges you'll be facing at each particular track. Every track is different. Some have nasty transitions between the racing surface and the apron that can easily throw the car into a spin, while others have smooth transitions that can be made at higher speed. Some tracks have pit access and exit roads that you need to use. Some tracks have one pit lane and some have two. The pit road speed limit at each track can vary from 35 to 65 miles per hour, so make sure you know what it is. Okay, so now it's time to make a pit stop. Step number one consists of pulling off of the racing surface, getting onto pit road, and slowing down to the pit road speed limit. Simple, right? Well, not always. First of all, 
You want to make sure that you don't have any cars in the way when you duck down off the racing surface. Be sure to use your mirror to watch for any last second surprises. When you come down off the racing surface and onto the flat part of the track called the apron, try to be smooth with the controls, especially the brake. You'll be braking and turning as you make that transition, so it'll be easy to send the car into a spin. As you're bringing the car down toward the pit entrance, you want to look for a white or yellow line that usually crosses pit road just before the pit stalls begin. That line is the point at which the pit road speed limit goes into effect. You want to try to time your braking so that you get down to the pit road speed limit just before you reach this line. This part of the pit stop is the riskiest one, no doubt about it, but it can also be the most rewarding one too, because if you time everything just right, you can save a lot of time. Step number two involves traveling down pit road to your pit stall. This can be tricky, especially if a bunch of cars are all pitting at the same time, as is often the case after a caution flag. Each pit road has two lanes. You'll want to stay in the outermost lane until you get just a few stalls away from your pit stall. At this point, move over a lane. That will set you up for a nice smooth approach into your pit stall. Step number three involves pulling into your pit stall and parking your car in the proper position. If you don't park within the boundaries of your pit box, you won't be able to get any pit service. Even if you are inside the pit box, you can't get too close to the inside pit wall. If you do, your pit crew won't be able to change your inside tires. To park in the right place, use your pit sign as a guide. As you pull into the stall, your pit sign man will lower the sign across the front of the stall. When you're just starting out, your goal should be to just touch the middle of the sign with the middle of your front bumper. If you do this, you'll park in the right place every time. As you get more experienced at pitting, try to park so the car is at a slight angle aimed toward the outside front corner of the stall with the outside front wheel just barely inside the pit box. This can make it much easier to exit the pits if you have another car pitting in the stall immediately in front of you. Step number four involves pulling out of the stall, getting back up to the pit road speed limit, and getting to the pit exit. This can be difficult to do when pit road is crowded, and it's especially difficult if there's a car pitting immediately in front of you. As your pit stop is finishing up, look in the mirror and try to plan your exit. When the crew chief yells, go, 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 pull out into the first lane as soon as you can and get up to the pit road speed limit as fast as you can. If there's a car parked immediately in front of you, you may need to nail the gas and use wheel spin to get out of your stall. Once you're in the first lane, keep glancing at the mirror and pull into the outside lane as soon as you can. This is very important when there are other cars on pit road because you never know when they'll try to pull out of their stalls. Once you're safely in the outside lane, Concentrate on staying as close to the pit speed limit as you can. When you get past the final pit stall, you'll usually see a line crossing pit road. That line shows you where the pit road speed limit ends. Once you reach that point, your spotter will tell you, OK, you're clear of pit lane. As soon as you hear that message, you're clear to start accelerating back to racing speed. There's one more thing you need to keep in mind before we move to the next step. If you're pitting under yellow flag conditions, there will be a NASCAR official stationed at the end of pit road. He's called the Stop Go Man. If you reach the end of pit road and the Stop Go Man is displaying the green go sign, you're free to leave the pits like you normally would. However, if he's displaying the red stop sign, you're not allowed to go past him. If you do, you'll be penalized. So if you see him holding the stop sign, don't pass him and wait until the sign changes to go. Then you can leave the pits normally. Okay, we're almost done. The final step of the pitting process involves accelerating back up to racing speed and merging with race traffic. Once you've cleared the pit exit, you can go as fast as you want, but you're not allowed to immediately pull back up onto the racing surface. At the majority of the oval tracks, you'll need to stay to the left of the line which separates the apron from the racing surface, and you won't be allowed to cross it and merge until you get around to the back straight. On the other hand, some tracks will let you merge before the first turn. In other words, Here's another instance where you'll need to learn the procedure for each track. If you're not sure of what to do, use some of your practice time to follow one of the computer-controlled cars as it exits the pits. You'll also want to listen for two very important messages from your spotter. If you attempt to merge too early, your spotter will say, don't merge yet. Once you finally reach the legal merge point, your spotter will say, OK, merge when you can. When you hear that message, look in the mirror, and when it's safe to merge with race traffic, Go ahead and do it. Once you're sure of a particular track's pit exit procedure and its merge point, 
You'll want to practice getting from the pit exit to the merge point as quickly as possible. Keep in mind, as you leave the pit exit, you're usually driving around on the apron, which isn't banked as steeply as the racetrack. You're also in a low gear, so it's very easy to apply too much throttle and spin the car. It takes a lot of care at pit exit up until you get to the back straight to make sure that you don't end up in the wall. Well, that just about wraps it up. Practicing your pit stops may not be the most exciting thing in the world, but hopefully you now understand just how important it is. Just a few minutes of pitting practice can save you precious seconds when the time comes to make that pit stop under pressure, and it's a whole lot easier to make up time in the pits than it is to make it up on the racetrack. Drafting, or slipstreaming, is a technique in which two or more cars race nose to tail as closely as possible. The lead car breaks the air in front and creates a vacuum between its rear end and the second car's nose. This vacuum pulls the second car toward the back of the first. As the second car gets closer to the back of the first, the aerodynamic drag on the lead car is reduced. The net effect is that both cars become faster than they would be if they were racing by themselves. How much faster? Well, at the restrictor plate tracks, where the drafting effect is magnified due to the less powerful engines being used, two experienced drivers drafting together can make up about two seconds per lap on an experienced driver who is running by himself. By being patient and staying in line, a group of two or more cars can run down a single car very quickly. Conversely, two cars running side by side will create drag and slow both of them down. Use this knowledge to your advantage. If you're part of a draft train and you see a couple of cars up ahead battling and racing side by side, stay in line and just watch how quickly you reel them in. There are two downsides to the draft. First, unless you're leading the draft train, you'll be blocking the flow of air to your radiator, so keep an eye on that water temperature gauge. If it really starts to skyrocket, you'll need to get some fresh air into the radiator to cool things down. If you're really good, you can do this without giving up your spot in line. Pull out from behind that car in front of you just enough to cool the engine, but not enough to let the car behind you take your spot in line. This takes a lot of practice to pull off, but it's an extremely valuable skill to have because once you've mastered it, you'll be able to put more grill tape on the front of the car than the other guys, and more grill tape equals more speed. The second downside to the draft is that at the restrictor plate tracks, the draft is so strong that it's impossible for a single car to pull away from a group of cars that are drafting together. This means that the field tends to remain bunched together, making it easy for a small mistake to trigger a big accident. That's why patience and discipline are so vital to success at Daytona and Talladega. To master the draft, you'll need to know exactly where the front end of your car is, because once you get up to the back of that other car, at some point you'll need to back off in order to avoid bumping into him. This is critical when you're turning, because any contact at that point is likely to send one or both of you careening up the track and into the wall. For this reason, you'll find that while inexperienced drivers can draft to the point of bumping on a straight, they will back off a lot in the turns. To minimize your lap times, you'll need to figure out just when and where to back off the throttle so that you can stay right on that other car's tail all the way around the racetrack, even in the turns. Drafting is all about momentum. When you're really hooked up with another car or group of cars, you can build up a ton of momentum. To get to the front of the field, you'll need to learn how to recognize who's got that momentum and who doesn't, and try to put yourself in a position so that you're always a part of the group with the most momentum. If you want to pass that car in front of you, you'll need to pull out from behind him and hope that the cars behind you decide to stay with you. If they do, chances are you'll be able to zoom right by. If they don't, you could find yourself all alone with no drafting help, and you'll often have no choice but to watch the draft train zoom right by you. This is what the pros call being hung out to dry. If this happens to you, don't panic. Just try to get back in line before you find yourself at the back of the field. If you're stuck in the line behind someone and you see another group of cars drafting up towards you, don't be afraid to pull down and get in front of that group so that you can hook onto the front of the train. If you've picked up a head of steam and are coming up on a group of cars from behind, don't be afraid to take the high line in order to get around them. Your momentum will usually be more than enough to offset the additional ground you'll need to cover by going to the outside. Okay, we've talked about how to pull out and pass, but what if you're the lead car in the draft? Most of the time, you're a sitting duck. Once that car behind you gets even a bumper up alongside you, he and his drafting partners can zoom right by. How can you defend against this? Well, to be perfectly frank, the odds are against you unless there's just a single car behind you. 
but there are a couple of things you can do to hold off the pack if you find yourself at the front of the field as the laps are winding down. First, you can take a low line around the track. If they're going to draft past you, make them work for it and do it on the high side. They'll need to travel a greater distance in order to get by, and there's a chance that once the car immediately behind you goes to the high side, one or more of his pursuers will pull down into your lane and sell him out. Second, you can try to do what the pros call breaking the draft. On the straights, move back and forth across the track in order to reduce the aerodynamic advantage you are giving your pursuers. Of course, you need to be careful that you don't lose too much speed by doing this, but you'll find that sometimes, in an attempt to match your moves, the draft train will break up and lose its momentum. Lastly, use that mirror and do some basic defensive driving. At the restrictor plate tracks in particular, it's very common for pass attempts to be initiated at the start of the straights. Anticipate this, and as you come off the corners, be prepared to move to the low side to block. Again, you're looking to break the momentum of your pursuers, and by making a move that causes them to lift off the throttle for even a split second, you'll be doing exactly that. There's one last little drafting tip that can help you out, especially if you find yourself all alone and being pursued by a group of cars, and that's to use slower traffic to your advantage. Even the slowest cars can provide you with a brief draft benefit. Just pull down behind one and stay there until you're about a second away from making contact, then pull out and pass. When you do this, it's very important that you be smooth with your steering. Any violent jerking of the wheel will bleed off speed and will nullify the positive effects of the draft. Races are often won and lost in the pits. Knowing when to duck into the pits and when to stay out on the track, when to take two tires instead of four, and when to do what the pros call short pit, are just three items on the list of skills that you'll need to learn if you want to become an educated racer. Let's go over them one by one. Let's get the most obvious tip out of the way first. It's always better to pit under caution than it is to pit under green flag conditions. If you pit under green, you'll lose at least one lap at most of the tracks. On the other hand, if you pit under yellow, you won't lose a lap unless you're making major repairs to your car. Many times, you'll have no choice but to pit under green, but in general, you'll want to delay that pit stop for as long as you can, because if you pit under green and lose a lap, and then the yellow flag comes out, your opponents will be able to come in, make their stops, and keep you a lap down. Let's say you're racing along and a caution flag comes out. You've still got a decent number of laps to go until you'd normally come in and pit. What should you do? Do you pit and risk dropping to the back of the field? Or do you stay out there and maintain your position? As usual, the answer is, it depends. In this case, it depends on quite a few things. First, how many laps are left in the race? If it's early, it's almost always to your benefit to come in, unless of course you've just pitted a couple of laps ago. In addition, if coming in will reduce the total number of pit stops you'll need in order to finish the race, you'll want to do it. As the race progresses, track position becomes more important, so as the laps start to wind down, you'll want to gradually lean more in the direction of not pitting. Second, how are your tires and fuel holding out? If you're close to making a stop anyway, you'll usually want to come in and take advantage of the caution flag. If it's late in the race and you think you'll be able to make it to the end, you may want to stay out there. Third, where are you in the standings? If you're at the front of the field, you're more likely to want to stay out there. On the other hand, if you're near the back of the line, you'll probably want to come in, because you'll need to pass far fewer cars, if any, in order to get back to your old position. Also, if you're at the very end of the line, you may want to come into the pits again as the field goes to one lap to green, just so that you can top off your fuel one more time. If you're going to be at the end of the line anyway, you've got nothing to lose by doing it. Fourth, where are you racing? If you're at a track where it's tough to pass, or where running on worn tires doesn't slow you down that much, you'll want to lean towards staying out. If you're at a track where passing is easy, or where worn tires translate to a big performance penalty, you'll be more likely to come in. Finally, what's everyone else doing? If you're in contention and you see the entire field coming into pit, you're probably going to want to follow suit, because if you don't, all those cars will have fresh tires and will essentially turn you into a sitting duck when the green flag flies. As you can see, it's not always easy to decide whether or not to come in and pit. There's always the chance that coming in and making a stop will put you so far back in the field that you won't be able to catch up to the leaders. And there's always the chance that staying out there 
will do nothing but ensure that you get blown into the weeds on the restart. The good news is that at least now you know all the factors you'll need to consider when the time comes to make that important call. One of the biggest decisions you'll face when you come into the pits will be how many tires to take. Taking two tires instead of four can cut several seconds off of your pit stop, especially if you're not adding a lot of fuel. By taking just two tires, you can gain a lot of track position, assuming, of course, that most of your opponents decide to change all four. The downside of taking two tires is that you'll still have a pair of worn tires on the car, and that will almost always slow you down, especially in the long run. For that reason, it's usually best to consider making a two-tire stop only if it's late in the race. When you're considering taking just two tires, the main question you'll need to ask yourself is whether or not the gain in track position will be offset by the loss in speed you'll experience versus the cars that took four fresh tires. At tracks where it's difficult to pass, you'll be more likely to take two tires simply because it will be easier for you to defend against losing those positions you gained. If you're like most people, chances are good that you won't be running full-length races. Many people like to set up their races to be just long enough to require one pit stop. For example, let's say that a particular track usually requires a pit stop between laps 35 and 40, and the race length has been set to 50 laps. In that case, you may want to do what's called short pitting, and come into the pits before tire wear or fuel use force you to come in at the usual time. Why would you want to do this? Well, it's simple, really. You have to make a pit stop anyway, so you might as well try to time it so that you're minimizing the total number of laps that you're on worn tires. So, using the example of the 50-lap race, you'd want to come into the pits right around halfway or lap 25. Of course, this strategy can be very dangerous during races with yellow flags, because it makes it easy for a poorly timed caution to put you a lap down. However, if you're racing with yellows turned off, you'd really be crazy not to do it. There's one final little bit of pitting strategy that's worth mentioning. If you're running for the championship, you'll get five bonus points for leading a lap. Sometimes the best way of getting those points is during a caution period, when all the cars in front of you decide to head for the pits. By staying out on the track, you can lead a lap and get credited with the bonus. Of course, the downside to doing this is that if you need to make a stop during that caution period, you'll have to do it on the following lap. By that time, the field will have caught back up to you. By the time you come in, pit, and come back out, you'll usually find yourself at the very back of the field. This may seem like a heavy price to pay for a measly five points, but if it's early in the race, or if there aren't a lot of cars on the lead lap, it can be a smart move, especially if you're off the pace and you think it's only a matter of time before you get put a lap down. Racing is an activity that is part man, part machine. Great controversy rages over just how much man versus how much machine it takes to win. One thing is certain, a great car is useless unless driven by a good driver, and at the top levels of racing, a great driver has no chance without a good car. NASCAR Racing 2003 season provides you with a good car. It actually provides you with an infinite number of good cars, which is a pretty good deal. Your car can be changed in many ways by tinkering in the garage or in the pits. A car's setup is a particular set of choices about all these changes. In the garage, you can select one of several default setups, which provide a predictable, good car to drive without having to know the details, or you can dive into the details. This first part of the lesson will cover a few key ideas that are good to know as you start tinkering in the garage. Until you feel that you have mastered driving these cars, you may not be able to tell when you have changed something for the better or worse. Before changing anything in the garage, work on driving consistent, repeatable laps. Only when you can do this will you be able to pinpoint how a particular change in the garage affects your car's handling. Really fast setups can require considerable skill, and the beginning driver is likely to think a great car is an awful one. In short, until you are a good driver, don't worry about trying to make a great car. The default setups can help you become a good driver. The easy setup is made for the beginning driver. It will track in a straight line with the steering wheel centered and the front tires will tend to start sliding first, making the car behave more like a street car. It's best to start with the easy setup and stay with it until you can put the car where you want it on the racetrack. Once you are able to lap consistently, try switching to the fast setup. This is more like a real oval car setup and it will pull to the left down the straights. Now you will need to develop the skill to balance the car while it's skidding around the turns. When you're looking for even more speed, it's time to go to the garage.
As you can see, there are a lot of changes you can make in the garage. Clicking the right mouse button over any of the items will show you a short explanation of that item's effects on the car. The settings generally involve three things. Trying to stick the tires to the road better, finding a balance between grip and top speed, and finding a balance between speed and reliability. Most of the settings in the garage are for fiddling with how well the tires stick to the road. The more grip the tires have, the faster you can go in the corners, and the fastest driver in the corners usually has the highest average speed for a whole lap. There are many things that affect a tire's grip with the road, but the three most important are how much rubber is in contact with the road, how sticky that rubber is, and how much weight that tire is carrying. How much rubber is in contact with the road is affected by the tire pressures, a lower pressure makes a bigger patch of rubber, and camber, which is how much the tire is leaning over. The best grip is usually found with the tire leaning slightly into the turn. Unfortunately, when the car is moving, the camber is changing all the time. For example, when the car body rolls in a corner, and the tire pressure changes as the tire heats up. Fortunately, the tire temperatures from your last run are shown in the garage so you can figure out if the pressures and cambers are okay. After a few laps, the tire temperatures will settle down to values which tend to remain the same from lap to lap. This may take five to seven laps. The temperatures are shown for each tire at the inside edge, I, middle, M, and outside edge, O. What you want to see on an oval is a slightly higher temperature on the left edge, the inside on right-hand tires, outside on the left tires, and a middle temperature that is about the average of the inside and outside temperatures. On a road course, you like to see slightly higher temperatures on the inside edges. If that's what you're seeing, then the cambers and pressures are close to their optimal setting for grip. If either edge is too hot, there is probably too much camber on that tire. It is leaning over too much in the corners. Negative camber will heat up the inside edge more. Positive camber will heat up the outside edge. If the middle temperature is too hot, you may be running too much pressure. The temperatures can also tell you how sticky the tire is. They stick best at an average temperature of 190 to 240 degrees. If a certain tire is too hot, increasing the pressure can help cool it off. Conversely, lowering the pressure in a tire that's too cool can help heat it up. The other way to change the temperature of a tire is to put more or less weight on it. That is where a lot of the other settings come in. When your car is sitting still in the garage, each corner is weighed and the results can be seen by clicking the weight bias tab. Ballast blocks can be moved around in the car to change how much weight is on the left side or on the front. You can also put more or less weight on the diagonally opposite wheels. This is called wedge. The settings under the weight bias tab allow you to change what are called the static corner weights. This is how much each corner weighs sitting still or static in the garage. As soon as you start driving around the racetrack, however, the corner weights change constantly. Accelerating puts more weight on the rear tires. Braking puts more weight on the front tires. Cornering puts more weight on the outside tires, the right side on an oval. The primary suspension settings, springs, shocks, and sway bars, all affect how much weight shifts to each particular corner while maneuvering around the track. What's important to understand is that we want each one of the four tires doing as much work as it can. We don't want any freeloading tires. Anytime one tire has more weight on it than another tire, it is probably working harder, and both those tires together won't have as much grip as they would if both worked equally hard. Balancing the work done by the four tires will consume most of your effort in the garage. The tire temperatures can help again with this. If two tires are working equally hard, they will likely end up at a similar average temperature. So ideally, we'd like all four tires to be at the same temperature, but this won't happen in reality. There is no way within the regulations to get the left side tires to work as hard as the right side tires on an oval. But the closer you can get to that goal, the faster you are likely to be. What makes tuning a car's handling complicated is that every change can affect everything else. It's a bit like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. Fortunately, there are many combinations of settings that give a really fast and well-handling race car, and you get to tailor that handling just the way you like it. No two people seem to like the same setup, and that's what makes it interesting.
Once you're laughing consistently and have decided to poke your head into the garage, don't be afraid to play around. After all, you can always revert to the default setups if you really mess things up. And remember that you have an infinite supply of cars to test. The weather can have a significant effect on your car. A car setup that works just fine at 70 degrees with no wind may turn into a real handful once the mercury rises and the wind starts to blow. Let's go over the weather variables in the game one at a time. The track temperature is higher on a sunny day than it is on a cloudy day. A higher track temperature means that your tires will heat up more quickly, but it also means that they'll run hotter all the way through the run, and that will increase their wear rate. As its temperature rises, air becomes less dense. That means that your engine won't put out as much power. Change your gearing to compensate. Higher air temperatures also mean higher oil and water temperatures, which may force you to remove tape from the grill in order to prevent overheating. Finally, higher air temperature means a higher track temperature, and that translates to accelerated tire wear. The wind can wreak havoc with your car's handling. A headwind will slow you down and cause your car to push. A tailwind will speed you up and make you loose. And a crosswind will simply push you across the racetrack. The stronger the wind, the more magnified these effects become. If a tailwind is pushing you to the point of causing the engine to overrev, you can change your gearing or remove some grill tape to compensate. To compensate for a crosswind, you'll just need to adapt your driving style to deal with it. Qualifying is an important part of NASCAR racing, especially if you're running in a short race. In qualifying, your only concern is getting one or two hot laps out of your car, and that's it. With that in mind, here are a couple of quick tips that will help you get the most out of your qualifying setup. First, take that grill up as much as you can. Remember, your engine only has to last for a couple of laps. Second, use higher tire pressures. Over the course of just a couple of laps, you're not going to get a lot of heat into those tires, so they won't reach the optimal pressure unless you start them higher than usual. And that wraps up our final lesson. Now you'll want to move on to the next step of your racing education, and that involves finding out what makes each track tick. If you want to compete for the NASCAR championship, you're going to have to know every one of them by heart. It's time to take off the training wheels. Good luck.